So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. It's the um, this is the PFOS question and answer webinar. And I'm Sarah Alexander. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. And I'm here today with Caleb. And Caleb, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Sure. My name is Caleb Goosen. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm Mafka's crop specialist. So I work with our farmers um, with questions about growing uh, plants and growing food. Great. Thank you so much, Caleb. And um, thank you to everybody who's joining us today. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time and your interest in this subject. And we're going to try to cover a lot of information today. We are also going to have time for questions. We did get a lot of questions um, ahead of time. And we're gonna to try to answer most of those during the course of the presentation. We did look at all the questions that you submitted ahead of time. So hopefully we'll answer many of those, but um, with this subject, there are many more questions than we have answers generally. Um, there's This is a situation that's evolving in real time and we will be doing the best that we can to answer with the information that we have. And we may also just not have the answers at this point to some more specific questions. So please put your questions in the chat and we will try to get to as many of those as we can um, during the question section. But we're going to dive into our presentation here and, and hopefully that will help um, answer many of the questions that you may have. So if you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, first, we want to start out just by acknowledging that we are on Wabanaki land, um, that this land is stolen land and continues to be colonized by non-Native people at the expense of Native people, and that the Wabanaki are the people of the Don land, the Abenaki, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, and the Penobscot. And I want to just acknowledge that the topic we're talking about today, PFAS, um, does have a real and immediate impact um, for several tribal communities here in Maine, tribal nations, um, the Mi'kmaq have been dealing with PFAS contamination on land that was formerly Loring Air Force Base, and the Penobscot Nation um, is working to look into PFAS contamination in waterways and the impact that's having on fish, which are an important sustenance and, and cultural life way for all of the Wabanaki communities here in Maine. Um, so we will be putting information in the chat throughout the, the presentation today um, so people can learn more at different points, but I do just want to share a few um, specific resources for learning more about Wabanaki communities and, and um, the land that you might be living on, and you can see those here uh, with Wabanaki Reach, the first light learning journey, and you can go to native-land.ca to find out more about the land that you may be on today. So we're going to start out with an overview, um, big picture overview of PFAS, and then we're going to get more specific into more of the science that Caleb is going to share with us and go into. And then we're going to talk about what's currently happening on farms in Maine, what are some action steps that we can take, and then we're going to have um, plenty of time hopefully for questions and answers and trying to get through as many of those as possible. So to start out with, and, and this is just really high level, um, PFAS are a class of chemicals. Um, it's actually a class where we're using the term PFAS, but we're using that broadly. That refers to, I think, thousand more than a thousand chemicals that could be considered part of this class of chemicals. And they're used, they, they were invented in the 1940s. They've been used since then in different industrial processes. Probably the most um, famous kind of knowledge of what this comes from or why it was used was around Teflon. Um, that was one of the most um, kind of ubiquitous consumer uses, but really they've been used in processing and industrial manufacturing in many, many, many different industries um, over the last you know, 50 years. And so um, why we're talking about this today is that we're learning more about it and we're learning about more about the impacts on human health and specific concerns that we have here in Maine. I um, am sharing this graphic here just so you can, and it may be a little bit small for some of you, um, but just to sort of show you a little bit of the life cycle of 
PFAS. So first and foremost, these chemicals do not break down. They're called forever chemicals, which is why um, they, even though they were manufactured and, and used in industrial um, products 20, 40, 50 years ago, we're still finding them in the environment today. And if we start over here with the, the PFAS producing industries, they produced wastewater discharges that go into wastewater treatment plants, and some of them go directly into our waterways. The stuff that's coming out of the wastewater treatment plants goes into um, possibly landfills. Um, PFAS could come out of that as leachate. And then um, a big thing that we're gonna be talking about today is the use of biosolids. So the more solid component of what comes out of a wastewater treatment plant, if it had industrial um, wastewater or, or uh, contaminants that were in that are biosolids. Those biosolids were used um, and promoted by state agencies um, in starting in the late 70s um, all the way through today as a fertilizer for farm fields and they've been spread on farmland. And so the PFAS that don't break down through any of this processing at the wastewater treatment plant, then get into the soil um, that can infiltrate into groundwater, but it can also be taken up into food products and, um, and food that's grown or livestock that's raised on the land that may have been contaminated. And Caleb is gonna get much more specific and into the details around all of this. Um, but then those food products you know, may end up in, in our homes as consumers um, drinking water that may be contaminated may end up in our homes. And then we may also be exposed to PFAS through PFAS um, packaging and other treated materials. And if you can go on to the next slide. The reason that we're really concerned about this is that there are potential health effects of PFAS at pretty low levels. And some of these things include um, increased cholesterol levels, changes in liver enzymes, decreases in infant birth weights, increased risk of kidney or testicular cancer, um, increased risk of high blood pressure, and decreased vaccine response in children. And I think you know all of this research is is in its early stages. I mean, as as many things go, much there's much more to learn about this. But um, the fact that these things can be Im impactful on our health at relatively low levels is concerning. And the fact that they are um, being used in many parts of our um, industrial systems and therefore have ended up in many products and in, in many water uh, systems at low levels and now in some of our food, um, as those accumulate over time, they become more of a concern. Um, so going on to the next slide here. These are just some of the common items um, as consumers that we may find in our household that have um, PFAS in them. Food packaging has probably been one of the, um, the areas that's had the most exposure over the last few years of really looking at how do we get PFAS out of food packaging. That includes things like microwave popcorn bags, um, sandwich wrappers, takeout containers, fast food wrappers, you know, that that up until now has been looked at as the main way that PFAS might get into food. Um, but PFAS are also in other household items, personal care products, floss. Um, it's in stain resistant, anything that's stain resistant, like carpets, rugs, the upholstery on your furniture, nonstick cookware, Teflon, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the, the first kind of uses of this outdoor gear. This was one that was surprising to me in learning more about, you know, our many of our outdoor gears that are kind of waterproof or water resistant um, have PFAS as a coating and then firefighting foam, um, which is the source of, of contamination for more of the Air Force bases, the military sites and, and some other um, areas there. Next slide, please. So I want to emphasize at this high level picture that this is a national issue. Um, this is a map from environmental working group of suspected industrial discharges of PFAS. So sites throughout the country. Um, Maine is not unique in dealing with this situation. Um, it's something that is, is happening throughout the country. And these are also called everywhere chemicals in addition to forever chemicals. 
um, because they really do end up everywhere. And we're going to see in some slides in the future, you know, this is a worldwide problem too. This is a national problem, but really this is a problem that is showing up around the world and different countries are working to try to address it. Maine happens to be at the forefront in, in the country in terms of addressing this issue. And you can see when you look on the map here, you know, Maine doesn't have all that many dots on, on this map um, compared to some of the other states that have have been um, had more industrial manufacturing, but one of the the main sources that we're learning about here of of what has contaminated biosolids is um, the waste from the paper mill industry, the paper industry where paper may have been coated with PFAS um, for food packaging or other um, sort of waterproofing uses. So go on to the next slide, please. So this is um, a map that some of you may have seen, and I wanna just talk a little bit about, you know, so how did we get here in Maine? Why is Maine on the forefront of this? And some of you know this history already, um, but in 2019, the in Southern Maine, there was a dairy farm that came back with high levels of PFAS contamination. As the state started to look into that further, um, they created a, a commission to explore this issue and come up with recommendations. The recommendations were then brought forward to the legislature. And last year, the legislature passed a bill that required the Department of Environmental Protection to investigate and look into these um, sites. And so um, this map, which is just a, this is the highest level overview. Um, we'll, we'll share the link to the map for anybody who hasn't seen it. But I want to talk a little bit about you know, what this map does and doesn't tell us. So what DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, has gone through is going back through records of where licenses were issued to spread biosolids. And so they've compiled that. It took some amount of time because many of those were paper records. And um, so the information that they have been able to gather from the last 45 plus years um, they have put into this map. So what this map shows us is where licenses were issued to spread biosolids. And um, it may give us some indication on some of these as to where the biosolids may have come from. Um, but we, this map is not comprehensive. Um, so there may be sites that have not been uncovered yet or licenses that were not found in those paper records. And also what this site doesn't tell us is um, whether or not biosolids were actually spread on that land. So some uh, licenses may have been granted, but biosolids may not have been spread on that land. Um, and then also there is a lot of variation between biosolid sources and which sources may have higher levels of contaminants and which ones um, may have lower levels of contaminants. And so this map doesn't really tell us that information. What does start to tell us that information is that the DEP has taken steps as they start to test and investigate these sites to create tiers, which they um, believe are prioritized by the highest likelihood of contamination. So um, tiers one through four is what they've created. Um, it will take them years to get through testing all of the sites that are on this map and all of the sites that are in those tiers. But the, the areas, the communities that are in tier one, there are 35 communities that they've identified in tier one as um, where they're gonna start testing. And those are the areas that they believe may be, may be higher risk. And so as they start to do that testing, we'll find out more. Um, some other things that Caleb's gonna get a little more into, but I'll just share at, a, at the highest level is that you know, the situation is going to be different for every area. So this map, while it may tell us if there was a license there, um, it may not tell us how much was spread, if there was a stacking site where um, the biosolids may have been piled, which may have a higher level of concentration of PFAS. Um, and it may not tell us, you know, things about the type of soil or um, what's being grown there. And as we learn more, the PFAS move. They move through the water, they move through the soil, they don't break down, they continue to move. And so um, some a farm that may have had something spread on it 
may not have any contamination now. It may have 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 moved through the the system, moved out of you know into the water system, and a farm that may have a different type of soil may have a higher level there because it may not have have moved beyond that site. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to hand it over to Caleb to to start to get into more of the deeper science around this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, add to what Sarah was saying with that last slide in just how little we do know. Um, and, and farms that may have had a license sometimes may have only applied, the license may have been for five years and they may have applied once, or they may not have even applied at all. Um, so it's, it, it really can't be overstated that that map just it raises a flag for whether more investigation is warranted or, or maybe if it's uh, less likely to be needed. Um, so with the PFAS contamination, in terms of our food supply, you know, what is being addressed right now is trying to find those sources of high contamination, those tier one sites, things like that. That's where affected food may actually be a problematic. For the general population with a um, diverse diet from many sources and many different types of food, uh, your diet is not expected to be a large portion of how you're getting in PFAS. For most folks, the highest risks, uh, this is from a, a CDC, national CDC uh, webpage, uh, it, it's coming through contaminated water. So that's part of the same investigation. That's, that's kind of where we have to start first is just make sure that everybody's water is safe. And then linking that, of course, is fish that may be uh, living in that contaminated water or downstream. Um, actually, Actually, if the soil is contaminated enough, breathing in or accidentally swallowing that, that soil. Food packaging, you know, the food may be safe that goes into the packaging. There have been many more instances of the packaging adding PFAS contamination to this otherwise safe food. Um, and then sort of lower down are those consumer products, the things that are in all of our homes and the reason why most Americans have PFAS in their blood already. Um, and that would be the stain resistant clothings and fabrics, et cetera. Uh, so Anna, if you wanna move ahead, thank you. So this is a, a, from that same website, a compilation of different blood test levels for PFOA, which is just one of the PFAS com compounds. You can see up at the top, those who are closest to the exposure and notice this scale at the bottom, that is logarithmic. Uh, you know, they have a thousand parts per billion in their blood. Um, those are contaminated right there at an industrial site. They're highly exposed to it. The general public, if you look down um, towards the, the bottom where you see the Red Cross blood donors, um, NHANES, that's a national survey of health and diet, um, much lower. So in general, we are all exposed to some, but it's not the incredibly high levels that uh, someone with the most exposure might have. And that might be in, because of an industrial facility, most likely, or you can see some of these sort of in-betweens are communities that are probably ranging with their proximity and their exposure levels uh, to, to the source of the, the most contamination. And so that's where we're gonna be going into a lot of that gray area where pretty quickly, the, the most contaminated farms are being identified. And um, as we, you know, in that example of the dairies that were first identified, the concerning milk and dairy products have already been pulled out of the, the food system. Um, and that process is just gonna be continuing. Anna, if you can go forward one. Uh, here's another one of just individual PFAS compounds in blood levels uh, of, is sort of the general public around the nation. You can see starting 20 years ago in 2000, uh, that PFOS, is, which is a very concerning one, is at 30 parts per billion in the general pub public's blood. By 2014, it's closer to five. So a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. In general, our exposure to that compound, which has been discontinued in many manufacturers, um, in the US um, or is scheduled to be discontinued, that is, our exposure is, is lessening. And so 
shutting off that tap, you can see it will start to eventually go out of our bodies, but it takes a long, long time. Um, and that's why even small amounts of exposure, if they're continuous and it's chronic exposure, that's why it can become a buildup issue. And uh, the other take home with this one is that this is looking at four specific PFAS compounds that we know of and that we're concerned about for human health. As companies are switching away from these ones, they are choosing other PFAS compounds that are less studied. Um, and they may interact with our bodies differently. They may be less damaging. We just don't really know. We don't know how they're gonna move through the environment differently. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about like Maine's, expo Maine's legislative approach to PFAS and why that is, uh, I find help hopeful uh, in that we're kind of addressing the compound class, not just trying to knock down, okay, PFOS, let's get rid of that and then see it reduce and then see it replaced by another one. Um, Anna, if you could go to the next one. So this is from an EPA study, um, kind of looking at PFAS going through food systems. And they talked about uh, the, the general US food system and how it's similar to these reports coming from other nations. And I chose this, don't try to like uh, understand what all these individual colors are. Those are individual PFAS compounds. But to, you can see of these four different countries around the globe, everybody is, is dealing with PFAS exposure. Um, and you can see that uh, we're, it, it's mostly following similar patterns. Um, Brazil, Serbia, Spain, those ones uh, that have fish uh, studied tend to are showing that that's maybe a con higher concern. And as we pointed out, it's because a lot of these chemicals are getting into waterways. Um, and in general, grains and produce tend to be less of a concern, except uh, with instances with highly contaminated sites. If you wanna move forward, thank you. Um, so how is Maine dealing with, you know, when do we, how do we do things? This is screening levels that the state has been setting up because as they discovered it in milk, they had to know what is a safe level, can, you know, at what point do we say we cannot allow a consumer to buy this milk? Um, and unfortunately, there are no federally set safety levels. The FDA has opted not to set a level of what might be safe in our foods. So the state of Maine has had to do that work themselves. And um, we have to thank Maine CDC for doing all that work. And they're currently doing a lot more. Um, and potentially need more support to continue that work unless the FDA will do the work. And, and that's probably the longer term solution is that the FDA comes up with guidance. Uh, you can see they set a, a threshold for milk and that allowed a spot at which, okay, above that level, that milk cannot be sold. Um, and similar for beef and similar for fish. Um, these levels are currently being revised and they're most likely about to become more conservative um, as the impact on our health is better understood. So this current action level for milk is likely to be reduced um, so that milk that is bought, you know, from a larger processed facility that you go into the grocery store and, and buy um, that has been mixed from many different farms, it's going to have to be even lower than this level, uh, most likely moving forward and similar for all other levels. But these are this is the, the beginning. And you can also see the drinking water standard. Um, uh, while we're here, I should touch on this. I know it gets confusing. The drinking water standard is 20 parts per trillion. There's your 20. Um, and uh, you can see it's made up of six individual PFAS compounds. So it's actually, uh, if all of those six add up to 20, that's when that threshold comes in. All right, so Anna, if you can move ahead. All right, so how are PFAS entering our food supply potentially? Uh, if you have very contaminated water, you see on the left of the slide, irrigation water, um, or very contaminated biosolids application, uh, then that's gonna enter the soil. It's gonna interact with soil organic matter, uh, as well as be taken up directly through that water into a plant. It is looking, there's so many different PFAS compounds that they're all gonna behave slightly differently. They're interacting with bacteria and fungi in the soil. They're interacting with the soil organic matter. They're interacting with the plants. 
Um, and this is before, you know, we got to get to the plants before we can get to livestock. Um, the plants are then taking it up. What is appearing to be a trend, you know, this is all big caveats that still more research is needed, but we're seeing from studies out there that a lot of the PFAS tend to accumulate in the photosynthetic part, that, that leaf tissue, right? Anywhere that's a green photosynthesizing part of the plant, um, especially where you see on the slide, it says transpiration, that's water leaving a leaf. Most of the water that enters a plant leaves through the leaves, and therefore the PFAS in that water is more likely to get deposited in those leaves. Um, of course, if there's enough going into the plant, there is going to be some going into all aspects of the plant. But what has been noticed is that um, root structures, like think of carrots or potatoes, and fruit, think of tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and seeds, think of grains, corn grain, um, wheat, uh, potentially beans, things like that, those tend to not accumulate anywhere near as much as the leaves. Uh, the, the one thing to file away for later is if you think about uh, livestock feeding on hay or corn silage, which is a, the entire corn plant, um, there are a lot of leaf tissues in there. So that's one, one avenue that it can get into livestock. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is just a snippet from a study done in China. Um, the red bars are at a highly contaminated site near a factory that produces PFAS compounds. The green bars are 10 kilometers away. So slightly contaminated, but closer to background levels because I should probably pause here and give that caveat that at this point, our soil all has some level of contamination, most likely. I don't think anybody can find soil or manure or compost without some small amount of PFAS. We're trying to address the high contamination parts, and then we're going to be figuring out the air shades of gray. At what point is it a safe shade of gray, or at what point are we still concerned? And you know, is it, is it something that can be mitigated and is it something that cannot? But you can see this breakdown, um, the numbers, it, it's not actually a measure, it's of quantity, it's the bioaccumulation factor. So what is the likelihood that these parts of these crops are going to take up PFAS? Root vegetables, these, and also the caveat that they, this was only the PFAS that they were looking at because this was what was contaminating this site. Different sites are gonna have different PFAS showing up in their soils and their water. You can see these root crops not accumulating nearly as much as say the shoot crops is what they're saying. So leafy or, or leaf or plant stem, um, radish leaves, carrot leaves, uh, Chinese cabbage leaves, uh, chive leaves, lettuce leaves, Welsh onions, more of like less green. If you're thinking about the onion part um, that you're eating, it's usually white, it's not photosynthetic. It appears that that's maybe not gonna be taking up as much, maybe. Celery, also concerning. But then we get to a flower part of a vegetable, like a cauliflower head, less concerning. Fruit, concerning, you know, it's all gonna be, no one's gonna know for sure until we know, right? We're gonna have to actually test these individuals, but in general, it's likely to be safer than leafy greens in a highly contaminated site. Leafy greens in a less contaminated site are still unlikely to be a threat. Uh, and grains in general tend to take up very little. If you can go ahead to the next one. So then that gets us to the discussion of livestock. Um, this is a little snippet from a study in beef cattle. And it's, it's confusing if you're not familiar with a logarithmic scale, but that scale on the left is PFOS, which is the, the primary PFAS compound we're worried about in livestock. Um, you see that's 10, 100, 1,000. That means in between that 100 to 1,000 zone, we're talking about very high numbers but in between the 10 to 100 zone, it's a, a drastic difference, right? So uh, if you were to put it on a linear graph, it would look uh, like a much steeper decline. But this is describing a half-life, um, at what point the amount of this PFOS in the beef tissue reduced by half, and it was less than three months. So for just this example, 
we can be a little more conservative and assume it takes three months for any beef cattle that have been switched to clean feed and clean water. So they are no longer being exposed to the PFAS. Uh, within three months, the amount in the meat should be halved. Um, and that means within 12 months, you've gone through four halve lives. So the original amount has been reduced in half and then in half again, in half again, and in half again. And so 12 months later, you would expect to see only 1 16th of, if I've done my math right, um, of the original concentration still in the meat. So uh, finding this contamination and addressing it, there's still hope for, for livestock production. Um, any farm that uh, can get their water cleaned up, whether that's filtered or they already have access to clean water and then getting clean feed to the animals, they can, still have a future uh, except in the, the most dire situations where they can't get that. Um, milk is gonna be similar. The half-life may be slightly different. It may take a little bit longer to get uh, all of the levels coming out in milk down to a lower level. Eggs uh, are looking like they have a much shorter half-life. And so chickens, egg-laying chickens that are switched to clean feed and, and clean water and are not um, ingesting contaminated dust are going to have clean, very low levels of uh, PFAS in their eggs moving forward within a, a much shorter time. And can you go to the next slide, Anna? I'm sorry to be zooming through all this, but I'm also trying to save some time at the end for questions. Uh, a lot of people have asked about remediation potential. Uh, in terms of contaminated water, right now the best practice, the most accessible is carbon filtration. And so that's essentially activated charcoal. Um, and these are systems where the water gets filtered through the carbon, the carbon absorbs the, the PFAS and then eventually has to get switched out for a new filter. And that it, contaminated filter has to be landfilled. Um, there is some higher tech PFAS destruction technology that is being investigated. Um, I think it's still early days. I would suspect most home wells would not feature this unless they can make it very affordable and very accessible. Uh, it's using supercritical fluids, which are very high temperature, very high pressure, not something that's going to be really easy. In terms of contaminated soil, there aren't any great proven remediation strategies. People are investigating phytoremediation, which is when you grow plants and have them take up PFAS from the soil into their plant tissue. Um, it's not, it, it, it's any, any plant growing in contaminated soil is going to take up some of that PFAS. The questions are how much is in the soil? How much does a plant take up in one growing season? And therefore, how many growing seasons do you need to be removing those plants to remove it out of the soil before the soil is a low enough level? And then the other big question is, what are you doing with those plants? Because you now have contaminated plants and you're going to have to move that, uh, that tissue. Uh, in terms of bacterial remediation, I see somebody asking about mycoremediation, meaning fungal. I'm gonna lump these two together. Uh, microbial remediation potential is right now suspected to be very limited. Um, there are some folks investigating using bacteria. I, I don't think anyone's identified fungus that is helping, uh, but they are investigating bacteria on, from contaminated sites that may have some potential to break down some PFAS compounds. My concerns with this are, you know, it's not really proven. Uh, they're going with, these are trade secrets. Um, they're not sharing uh, as much data as we'd like to see yet. Um, in general, for microbes, it's gonna cost them more energy to break apart these compounds than they're going to get from breaking them apart. So they're most likely going to do it either in very unusual circumstances where you've stripped the soil of any other food source for them. In other words, making it absolutely terrible for farming um, or they're doing it by accident in sort of a um, co-breakdown as they're trying to break down other things they are accidentally breaking down PFAS. Then the big question there is what are they breaking it down into? You take a large PFAS molecule, you break it apart, you now have two small PFAS molecules. And I don't think we know enough yet to know whether that's a good thing or not. Um, so I would just say 
Uh, much more research is needed. Try not to, to plunge in, you know, two feet forward. Uh, we need, we absolutely do need to look at these things, but I'm hoping that, uh, I, I'm hoping that more research will inform us going forward. Right now, I don't think I'm aware of any of these soil remediation techniques that are going to work unless somebody has a great use for PFAS contaminated um, plant tissue. And next slide, Anna, thank you. So we've also gotten a lot of questions about PFAS and organic certification. Why didn't organic certification catch these issues before? Um, certification is about agricultural, man agricultural systems, right? So we're talking about what are conventional farming approaches and materials and what are organic approaches and materials. Um, PFAS don't make up, you know, PFAS contamination is not really a part of uh, expected agricultural practices. Maybe a little bit on the edges, right? Um, there, there may be some contamination here and there, but what we're talking about is an environmental contamination that uh, the, the growers that used, applied these biosolids, they didn't know that they were in there either. Um, I, I kind of liken this to if you had a, a home building certification that yes, this is a green building, it has natural materials and it has really good building practices that make it energy efficient, that doesn't necessarily protect you from it having been built on a contaminated site. Um, the organic rules, uh, as the national organic program, the federal program has uh, put them into, into code since the mid nineties have not allowed biosolid application. Um, they do allow for uh, addressing contamination. If there's known contamination, something could, uh, a non-compliance can be issued and, and that could be uh, not allowed potentially. However, without federal standards or, or even state standards for what is acceptable, because we know that there's a little bit of PFAS in all over, um, we can't easily say this can't be organic because it has PFAS in it, because we don't know at what point do we draw that line, uh, unfortunately. Um, so we really need FDA, EPA, and USDA action to give us thresholds for those kinds of things. Uh, we, uh, the way it, it works now is if there were to be a, as, as the state is setting its own thresholds, um, so if milk is testing above their threshold because they currently do have a threshold there, the state would issue a stop of sale and we could then also issue a non-compliance because if it's not eligible to be sold to consumers, you know, we're basically saying within your organic certification, you need to address this. Um, it's just part and parcel of how it would work. It would happen to anybody that was testing above that threshold and had a stop of sale issued to them. Right now, the there are no thresholds for many food items. So there's not much that can be done. And this is true of all food items, whether it's conventional or organic. Um, and so I would just want to urge everyone to have as much empathy and understanding that we're all learning this right now. When the farms that applied these solids applied them, PFAS were not known to be a part of them. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of farmer it was applying it. I know if I was a conventional farmer and I had this material offered to me for sale, I probably, I'm frugal. I might've gone for it because I was assured it was safe and it was gonna be a, a good way to recycle nutrients. Um, the issue comes further upstream. Why did the material get into, you know, where did that contamination originally come from? That's, that's the bigger concern for me. And from my, my personally, I feel like that's where our, our um, efforts need to be addressed, as well as, of course, addressing what's in the system now. So stopping that original contamination, shut off the tap, and then addressing what's already happened and try to uh, make sure that those hot spots, the really highly contaminated areas are either mitigated so the food can be safe or assisting the farmers so that they can uh, pursue a livelihood in some fashion that isn't also contaminating the food supply. Can you go to the next slide, Anna? 
So, uh, Sarah, was this me or you? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take this one. Um, so shifting a little bit um, and just want to move quickly through some of these slides here just to recognize the time and um, make sure we can answer a few questions. So as Caleb just mentioned, the farm families are the most impacted. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of production a farm is doing. Any any farm could be impacted by this, and it's uh, the impact on that family is the highest. So thinking about things like their own health of people that might be living on the farm, their physical and mental health, um, the financial health and implications of this. So um, certainly uh, lost sales, and we see that farms that have been contaminated are are pulling products even without guidance from the state on threshold levels because there just is not enough information known. But um, every every farm that I've talked to wants to ensure that they are selling safe products to consumers. Um, food safety and transparency is of utmost importance to, um, to farmers. And so many farmers are being proactive in pulling their products if there is a test that comes back high and there's some indication of contamination so that they can investigate that further and work with um, the state agencies to figure that out. So um, we have to remember most farms have debt obligations. So if they have no income coming in, that places the farm in financial jeopardy. Um, and then there's the, the bigger picture loss of value in the land and their, and their own brand um, through no fault of their own. And then there's just so much stress and uncertainty for many people right now, um, both farms that are doing testing or not doing testing is, is just knowing, not knowing what's gonna come, not knowing how to plan for the future and the unknowns of what this will bring. And as we said at the beginning, there are more unknowns than knowns in many cases as the research is behind on this. There's very little to no federal guidance on this and that the state is really trying to move as quickly as they can to do more testing and, and understand both the scope of the issue um, in terms of land contamination and water contamination, but also the impact um, on our food system. So next slide. I think I was gonna talk about this one. Yeah. I know lots of folks are wondering about their own testing. Uh, it's important to know that DEP is going to look at every single site that has had biosolids applied. The issue comes in timeline. You know, they're looking at the highest contaminated sites first, and I think for good reason. Um, if you were to live near or on a site that was maybe was lower tier contamination and they're less concerned about it, uh, it may take a few years for them to get to you. You can consider doing your own testing. Uh, would definitely recommend starting with water um, it's easier to collect. You can collect that sample yourself using guidance from DEP. And I think we have a link to their guidance. Um, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. And honestly, water is the, the more direct source of how it can get in to, con to contaminate your own body, um, as well as if it's in your water, then you are potentially applying it to your own land. Um, if you didn't have direct biosolids application on your soil, you probably don't have it directly in your soil, except from contamination from water. Uh, the soil testing is a lot harder. We don't recommend people do that themselves. Um, there, if you're at a site that is the DEP is going to get to, they'll they will probably be doing that testing. If you're a farmer, where the your the DEP is going to get to, DACF is going to help farmers and they may help address some of that testing as well. And we have some information specific for farmers trying to, to navigate these issues. Um, and uh, the long story short is that everyone and their brother is testing right now. And all we have limited testing facilities. The state is working to secure, secure more testing ability, um, but lab results that used to take a week or two to get back to people are taking maybe a month. And I'm, I'm concerned that at some point it's going to take longer because so many people are sending in tests. Um, so I would just encourage folks to evaluate your risk. By all means, test if you need to, but uh, if you don't have any reason to suspect that you have PFAS in your water, maybe hold back uh, a little bit just to, to allow these highly contaminated sites to do the testing that they need to do and get the results back that they need to get. Um, next slide, I think, will be Sarah. 
Yeah, and there, there are lots of questions coming in around testing. I know this is where we got a lot of questions um, ahead of this. So Katie has just shared the farmer resource page, which has links to the labs that are testing, more information about testing and what to think about there. Um, if, uh, uh, I guess if the DEP is doing testing, if there's a tier one community or farm that's being tested, DEP will pay for that test. If a farm chooses to do their own testing, the DEP will reimburse for that test or DACF will reimburse for that test if the test results come back high. That's why we're recommending just starting with a water test because then if the result comes back high for that, you can start to work with the DEP or DACF and they will pick up the cost of future testing for um, additional water, soil or product testing. And we are looking at um, putting together uh, a testing support fund so that anybody can test um, who wants to test. We don't want cost to be the, the reason that people can't test, certainly. Um, and we're working to raise resources right now. We did a pilot project uh, last year with the Farmer Rancher Stress Assistance Network, and we're hoping to expand that with some additional um, grant funds that we've, we're hoping that will come through this year. But um, just really quickly, you know, Mofka's response on this, we're doing a tremendous amount of, of farmer support. Caleb and our farmer programs team have been on the front lines of that. We're providing technical assistance, testing support. Um, in conjunction with Maine Farmland Trust, we've set up a farmer PFAS emergency fund to for farms that do find contamination to have income replacement and to provide other additional resources, including uh, mental health support and um, reimbursement for costs associated with that. And then we're working statewide. Um, there really is a, a very robust coordinated effort between all of the state agencies, CDC, DEP, and DACF that are working on this and all of the agricultural service providers um, like Cooperative Extension, MAFCA, Maine Farmland Trust, and others. Um, and we're working together to provide that, that holistic wraparound farm support that's needed in this moment, um, as well as with the, the FARSAN network, as I mentioned, and we're doing federal coalition work as well. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to share that there has been success on this, so I don't want to leave people thinking, you know, there's there's no hope here. Um, we had a very successful legislative session last year, and Maine is on the forefront of this, of passing both legislation that's going to help our farmers, um, help our anybody that's contaminated, and really help turn off the tap, like Caleb said, and make sure that we're stopping PFAS at the source. So. Um, more information about all of those, you know, can be found on our website and encourage folks to look at that if you're interested. And then if you can move to the last slide here. Um, there's much more action that is needed and there's two advocacy measures right now where we could, anybody who's in the state of Maine, um, LD 1911 would stop PFAS contaminated sludge um, and soils first from spreading. So it would stop the further spreading of biosolids and um, would help with this immediate issue while we you know, stop what we're doing right now to further investigate and assess what the contamination levels are so we can understand what the path forward can be. And then LD 1875 requires pre-treatment of landfill leachate from state-owned solid waste facilities. And this is um, very important, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the Penobscot Nation dealing with contamination and water and fish. And I think, um, Miku, thank you for for bring, pointing that out again in the chat. Um, but this would this would help with that situation of uh, leachate landfill from Juniper Ridge um, that's being released into waterways. So it's a two pronged approach. You know, we need to stop the spreading and we need to stop um, the contamination that's coming out of the landfill leachate. And then um, there's going to be more urgent actions that are going to be needed. Um, and we're going to be sending those out. They don't exist just yet. The governor just released her budget, but um, there's some additional funds in there for farm indemnification and farm support. And we're going to be advocating for even more um, at the legislature. And then we're also advocating for federal legislation for a farm safety net for food thresholds and more leadership at the federal level, as well as corporate accountability. Um, the manufacturers of these chemicals need to be held accountable and that will eventually happen through lawsuits and, and other federal actions, um, but we need action at every level at this time. And now we do have just a few minutes for questions and 
I know that there have been a lot that have been put in the um, chat here, so we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but I would just encourage um, folks to please check out the resources on our website and then also um, we'll put our information in the chat here and you can reach out to us uh, directly if you have more specific questions that that we can help with. Um, we're, we will be updating our frequently asked questions section on the website too as we have more information and some of this stuff um, we just maybe don't have answers to at this moment so um, just working backwards here uh, yes if a farm tests its water and comes back with PFAS levels above a certain level they can they should get connected up with DEP and DACF immediately and DEP and DACF will pay for further testing and help figure out the specific plan for that farm. And I would, I also would just share, in case we didn't say this earlier, the situation is going to be different for every single farm. Um, there is no one size fits all approach to this. It really is a farm by farm approach that's needed based on a data driven approach of what testing has happened on that farm, where there is contamination, and what the mitigation strategies are like putting um, filtration systems on irrigation water or on well water, um, looking at what kinds of crops are being grown, looking at if there was outside um, contamination coming in from feed that may have been brought in from a different source. So it's going to be a different picture for each farm who's addressing this and they will, working with the DEP and DACF, um, as well as those agricultural ser service providers like MAFCA and Cooperative Extension and M Maine Farmland Trust, we, each farm will have an individualized approach moving forward. Um, Kayla, we have a question about um, if you're growing with seeds contaminated from PFAS, what is what is the outcome in the plant? Yeah, so I'll I'll um sort of I also want to just touch on the the clarification about DEP and DACF. DEP is going to handle anybody's anybody's water that's contaminated. Contact DEP. Um, homeowners, residential, whatever. Farms are the ones that can contact DACF for further um, guidance because DACF is going to help them sift through things. Um, in terms of seeds that may have been grown on a soil that was contaminated with PFAS, they're because it's the seed of the plant, it's unlikely to have taken up much PFAS anyway. Uh, and whatever is in there is going to then be diluted by the, you know, if you have a seed that's this big, it's going to be diluted by the entire size of the plant that it grows into. So I would imagine that there's some trace amount that may carry through, but it's unlikely to be very high. Great. And um, we also have a question about. Um, how to dispose of products that may have PFAS contamination. And um, we, Caleb and I are not, not probably the right people to answer that question. Um, but Caleb, do you wanna take a quick I, I can, yeah, I'll give my uh, unqualified advice, right? Like I'm a crop specialist. I have a PhD, but it's in agronomy. Um, but uh, the, what I would think of in terms of milk is that we're measuring that in parts per trillion, which is really, really small amounts. And that measurement, that threshold that's being used is expecting chronic exposure. If you're talking about just one gallon of milk, the amount in there is probably lower than the amount that's in your blood currently. Um, and so whatever you're excreting um, into your own septic system or wastewater treatment plant, is probably adding the milk to that system is likely not going to change things much, but I can't guarantee that. Great. And for any solid products, I think this was a question that came through earlier, like household products or other things, um, putting putting those sorts of solid products into the uh, the landfill, essentially into your, your trash system. Um, with 1875, where PFAS contaminated leachate is going to be um, addressed, you know, that is probably the best solution right now for disposing of those products um, until a better solution comes along. But that's the, the landfilling is probably the, the best solution that we have available right now, even if that's not 
a long-term solution to the, the larger issue here. Yeah, unfortunately, if you think of something that has scotch guard on it, right, stain repellents, you're gonna throw it into the garbage the same way you always have um, when it's worn out. Well, I know we are at time today and um, we will try to use the questions that you all have put in here to update our frequently asked questions page. And I'll also go ahead and put my email address into the, um, the chat here. So folks are interested or feel like they need to reach out um, to me directly, I'm happy to, to try to help point you in the right direction if I may not have an answer to your question. Um, but you can reach out to me and Mafka, you know, we're learning this at the same time you all are. We're trying to share the information in real time. Um, so I anticipate we will have more of these webinars as we learn more and as we can share more. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, more information to figure out here. And I think there is room for hope and that, you know, we are going to have the safest food system in the country. We're looking for contamination. Nobody else is looking for contamination. We're looking for contamination. And when we find it, it's going to be addressed and products are going to be, you know, pulled off of the shelf um, and making our food supply one of the safest in the country. So um, thank you all for all of your interest in this issue. I encourage everybody to read more of the resources on our website and, um, you know, please take action contacting your lawmakers about this issue whether it's at the state level or the federal level, regardless of where you live, even if you're outside of the state of Maine, is really important so that we can all move forward on this issue um, as a collective. So thank you all and um, more to come. <laughs>